All right, well, we are uh, back in Proverbs 1. And um, Proverbs 1, we'll uh, finish up the chapter here tonight. So verse 20 through verse 33. And uh, we find here in these, this last section um, of chapter 1 uh, in, in illustration, uh, specifically in regard to wisdom. So what we see here is uh, the offer and availability of wisdom. We see the freedom to choose wisdom or folly. We see the response of the foolish, the, the simple, and the scorner. And then fourthly, we see uh, their consequences, um, or the consequences of their choice or their response. Um, what we'll do is we will, um, I'll read 20 through 33, and then we'll, um, we'll just take uh, a number of um, assertions of, of principle out of, uh, out of this section here. And so beginning in verse 20, uh, we read, Wisdom crieth out, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. All right, so um, let's just make some, uh, some observations here, uh, specifically in regard to divine wisdom. Because as we said, um, we have here in these verses in, uh, uh, an appeal uh, or the appeal of God um, and the, um, the the illustration here is wisdom as uh, or wisdom personified right um, wisdom crieth without okay so wisdom here is pers personified wisdom of course we know and understand is uh, is uh, is God himself God is wisdom right and uh, he has made um, uh, Christ, he's made unto us, uh, or, or made wisdom, <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase this, uh, he has made Christ wisdom unto us, okay? I think Paul says that in um, uh, 1 Corinthians. And so we find here um, the appeal of wisdom, or wisdom's appeal to uh Three groups of people, the simple, the foolish, and the scorner. And so the first thing I'd like you to consider here from what we've read is that divine wisdom for mankind is a passion or desire of God's. Um, wisdom, we could say, is God's flawless design for the lives of mankind. And so naturally, it is God's passion, his desire uh, that mankind embrace uh, and take hold of his wisdom. We see that in a couple of ways here um, in verses 20 and 21. Number one, we see the manner of wisdom 
or the manner of God uh, uh, presenting or proclaiming his wisdom to mankind. First of all, we see in verse 20 where he says, Wisdom crieth without. Wisdom uttereth her voice in the streets. Verse 21, she crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the city she uttereth her words. And so we see the manner of divine wisdom. Divine wisdom is spoken in a voice that is easily heard. Now, uh, understand, of course, here that this is, um, uh, this is all in figure, right? It, it is a, um, a personification of wisdom, but the reality is that God's words are uh, living, right? And so wisdom cries out. We see the manner of divine wisdom, or we see the manner in which the, the, uh, a divine wisdom for mankind is a passion of God. Uh, because wisdom, divine wisdom, crieth out, right? It speaks, <clears throat> it speaks to mankind. At times it is urgent. Divine wisdom is something that God intends to openly and clearly communicate to mankind. And he has, and he continues to, right? There, there is not one part of this book that will pass away until all has been fulfilled. And so God is continually, forever, openly and clearly communicating his truth or his wisdom uh, to mankind. And so we see here the manner of wisdom. It, it, is, uh, it is clearly and openly communicated uh, to mankind. But we also see the place, right? The place in which it's communicated. Uh, uh, he, he says, wisdom crieth without. And the idea there, of course, is, <clears throat> is out in the open, right? Wisdom crieth without. Uh, notice he says, she uttereth her voice where? In the streets, okay? She crieth where? Verse 21, in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of, of the gates, okay? Wisdom uh, is personified here as, uh, as raising her voice in uttering uh, truth, uttering wisdom in the, uh, in the most open uh, place available, uh, the chief place of concourse. In other words, you, you, you could say, if you could imagine, uh, an open uh, an open air market, right, where 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 people are are passing each other, are doing business. She he, he speaks here of the openings of the gates. Okay, that that's where um, uh, legal uh, uh, transactions took place, where um, you know where uh, legal uh, uh, verdicts were were rendered. People would gather there for uh, for legal things. Um, and so it is all the, it, 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 the picture here is uh, uh, everywhere that men gather to go about their business, wisdom is, is crying out. It is seeking to make uh, her voice heard. And the idea, of course, is that God is seeking to communicate his truth anywhere and everywhere that, that uh, his creatures are living their lives and going about their daily business. And so here, divine wisdom is proclaimed in the place with the, with the broadest audience. And so we see here in this the passion of God to communicate his wisdom uh, to his creatures. Divine wisdom is also, here's another thought, a necessity for every one of God's creatures. Um, it's a necessity. Uh, we see the urgency, really, in verses 20 and 21. She's, she's crying out in the open places. She's uttering her voice in the streets. In other words, everyone who can hear her needs her. Uh, every individual 
needs divine wisdom. Excuse me. Hmm? Who's she? Wisdom. She is wisdom. Wisdom is she, and she is wisdom. Yep. Verse 20. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. So it's just a personification of the idea of wisdom. But divine wisdom is a necessity for every one of God's creatures. Given the common makeup in nature of every individual, there is a void for divine wisdom that needs to be filled in every person. Right? What is the common makeup in nature of every individual? We're all weak, sinful, human flesh. Right? That in and of itself necessitates wisdom. There is a void that must be filled in our hearts and minds with divine wisdom. And so everybody has this necessity for divine wisdom. And we see that, uh, we see that clearly communicated here in the text. Here's another thought that we see here in this passage. Divine wisdom does not find a place in the hearts of certain individuals. Okay? It does not find a place in the hearts of certain individuals. Notice with me in verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? How long will the scorners delight in their scorning? How long will the fools hate knowledge? Verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would not or didn't want any of my reproof. And so divine wisdom clearly does not find a place in the heart in the hearts of certain individuals. He mentions three groups of people here, and you see them mentioned throughout um, throughout the Proverbs. Um, first of all, you have the simple or the simple ones. And the word literally means to be open, right? Uh, if anybody ever tells you to be open-minded, <laughs> um, biblically, it's not a good thing, right? This is the definition of, simp uh, 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 of the simple, right? We must not be open-minded to anything and everything. We must uh, discern truth and wisdom, and that's the definition of the simple or the simple ones here is that they are open. In other words, they, 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 they will fall for anything. The second group of people here is the fool or the foolish ones. And the fool is just a, uh, just, uh, uh, a hard, hard, uh, hard headed, uh, self-centered, self-pleasing individual, right? He has no care or concern for how his actions or words affect other people. He has no care or concern with how his actions and his words uh, uh, please or displease uh, his creator. That's the fool. The third group of people here are the scorners. The scorners... Uh, are, are kind of a uh, they're they're kind of a, a, a step past the fool, right? The scorner it has a hardened heart, um, and he uh, he despises divine wisdom. The fool he just doesn't care, but the scorner has hardened his heart against divine wisdom. He uh, he despises it. He wants nothing to do with it. Uh, so we have those three groups of people, and in their hearts, divine wisdom does not find a place. But notice the common denominator here. If you would, in verse, um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, verse 22. Notice um, the verbs here, okay, because they kind of point to one common denominator and he says, how long, ye simple ones, ones, will ye love simplicity? And then he says, how long will, you, will the scorners delight in their scorning? 
And how long will the fools hate knowledge? Okay, each one of these um, verbs, uh, which are approaches of the heart towards divine wisdom, uh, have a common denominator, and that is they are responses of the heart, right? The simple loves simplicity. The scorners delight in their scorner, and the fools hate knowledge. These are all responses of the heart towards divine wisdom. And so receiving divine wisdom then is a matter of the heart. It is a response of the heart. And so anytime you observe somebody and you think that's who Solomon was describing, right? Either a simple or a fool or a scorner. Uh, you, you can mark it down. There is a heart problem there. And so divine wisdom doesn't find a place in the hearts of certain individuals. But notice next that the call of God to divine wisdom is not simply an offer. Okay, It's more than that. It is, in fact, a call to turn toward wisdom from its antithesis. Notice in verse 23, he says, turn you at my reproof. That's wisdom speaking. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. It's not just simply an offer. I'm here. I'm available. Wisdom is a call. Divine wisdom is a call to reject simplicity, folly, scorning. Why is it? Why is that? Well, the heart of God has always been to restore his image in mankind where sin has marred that image, right? And so the call to divine wisdom is God's call to, to mankind to allow his image to be restored in him. And so uh, this call of divine wisdom, it's a call from God, but it's not simply an offer. It's a call to turn toward his wisdom and turn from those things that are antithetical to divine wisdom, simplicity, folly, scorning. God wants to restore uh, his image in us, and he does that by imparting his wisdom to us. Another thought here is this. Wisdom hinges, divine wisdom hinges on repentance from its antithesis. Okay, in verse 23, we saw him saying, turn you at my reproof, and then what, what's the promise to follow? Behold, pay attention, look, understand, I will pour out my spirit unto you. He says, I will make known my words unto you. And so divine wisdom hinges on the simple or the fool or the scorner repenting from their simplicity, their folly, and their scorning. And this is a sure promise that will follow repentance, that wisdom will be poured out, that, uh, that, that the understanding of God's truth will be made known to that repentant heart. And so we'll see in just a moment the self-destruction of a rejection of divine wisdom. But the truth is that self-destruction by folly can be averted by God dependency for wisdom, right? Re repentance, a, a change of mind, turning toward divine wisdom uh, will rescue men from the consequences of uh, their own of their own way and their own self-destruction. Notice also with me that divine wisdom bears no blame in the demise of those who reject it. Look at verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set it not all my counsel. In other words, you've, you've pushed it aside. And you would none of my reproof. You didn't want it. 
And because of that, he says, notice in verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge, and they didn't choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Okay? So divine wisdom bears no blame here in the demise of, of those who reject it. And mark it down, there is a demise of mankind without divine wisdom. But it's not divine wisdom's fault. Divine wisdom has been rejected. And the truth is it will be proven true. Divine wisdom will be proven true. It'll be shown to be uh, to have been accurate and right and good in the end, and that's illustrated there in verse 26, where wisdom says, I will laugh at your calamity, and, uh, and, and I will mock when your fear cometh, right? Divine wisdom will be shown to be true. We live in, an, we live in a day where uh, divine wisdom is mocked and laughed at. What's good is called evil, and what's evil is called good. But in the end, the roles will be reversed and divine wisdom will win out in the end, so to speak. But every man will be responsible for his own choice. Divine wisdom bears no blame. Notice also in verses 27 and 28 that divine wisdom cannot overturn the consequences of its rejection. Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. It's too late, right? The destruction and the devastation has already come upon them. The, the distress and the, ang and the anguish has overwhelmed their lives. They are suffering the consequences of their own simplicity, folly, and scorning. And divine wisdom cannot overturn those consequences. Though folly will call out for wisdom to help, to rescue, the earnest plea cannot turn back the consequences of the fool's previous choices. There will always be lingering and lasting consequences, and divine wisdom can't do anything about those consequences. And of course, in the matter of eternity, there will never be any escape. Divine wisdom, uh, another thought here, divine wisdom is received by choice. It's received by choice. We saw that in verse 24 and 25. Because wisdom called, but the simple, the fool, and the scorner refused. Wisdom stretched out her hand, but no man regarded. In fact, they set it not her counsel, and they didn't want any of her reproof. Verse 29. Uh, they hated knowledge. They didn't get this. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would or they wanted none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. And so divine wisdom is received by choice, right? The span between wisdom and folly is bridged by personal choice. Which way will you go? It's not, it's not inevitable one way or the other. It's, pers it's a personal choice. What will you accept and what will you reject? Divine wisdom has to be received by personal choice, right? That's why wisdom is crying out in the streets in the chief place of concourse. Two more thoughts here. Uh, the rejection of divine wisdom reaps bitter fruit 
in the end. Notice verses 31 and 32. Therefore shall they, those who reject wisdom, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. And so the rejection of divine wisdom reaps bitter fruit in the end. It reaps the antithesis of what it thinks it's going to receive, right? The simple in his simplicity, he thinks he's got it made. He thinks he's on the right track. He thinks that he is going to enjoy the fruit of his pursuit. Same thing with a fool, same thing with a scorner. But in the end, the fruit that they reap is bitter. They'll eat of the fruit of their own way. They'll be filled with their own devices. They'll be, uh, they're, they're, they're turning away from wisdom will slay them. Uh, the prosperity of fools will destroy them. It's not a pretty sight because they will reap the opposite of what they think they're going to receive. Last thought here is in verse 33. And that, in, in that is that divine wisdom is the only safeguard and protection guaranteed for mankind, right? Divine wisdom is the only sure safeguard and protection for the life of mankind. But whoso, notice with me in verse 33, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And that, of course, shows the effect of wisdom upon man's heart. It's not saying that you'll never experience trouble or affliction, heartache, but what is the promise there? You'll dwell safely. You'll be secure. You will be quiet from, not from evil, but from fear of evil, right? And so divine wisdom is God's sure safeguard for the life of mankind. And so um, a, lot of, a lot to digest here and to chew on, but hopefully these principles have given you, um, have given you a, 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 a um, a good overview of biblical and divine wisdom. A couple of thoughts here, a couple of questions to ask by way of application for you and I, right? How does this apply to me? You know, maybe you say, well, I don't consider myself a simple one. I don't think I'm a fool or a scorner either. Uh, but what is the, uh, what is the potential for you and I to act like the simple, the fool, or the scorner. So a couple of questions here. Do any of the individuals in this passage describe me? The simple, the foolish, the scorner. Uh, question number two, in what aspect of my life have I rejected God's wisdom? In what aspect of my life have I rejected God's wisdom? And here's, an, here's something to help you. Here's another question to help you answer that question, perhaps. What am I pursuing without seeking out God's wisdom? What am I going after without looking to God for his wisdom? And then last question here to consider is this. On the positive side, in what ways am I pursuing divine wisdom? How am I exercising myself towards attaining and obtaining God's wisdom for my life? I trust that you'll take those questions and you'll consider them personally in your own life and that God will use uh, these thoughts uh, to strengthen and help us spiritually in the days ahead. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this uh, passage. We thank you, Lord, for these truths and Lord, how how vital and how crucial uh, 
Lord, it is for us to, Lord, to really get a hold of, um, uh, Lord, what's in this passage. And I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, just stop us uh, uh, still in our in, in our steps, Lord, in, in our current, um, Lord, life path and pursuits. And, and I pray that we would honestly and with uh, Lord a just a heart of surrender before uh, before you honestly evaluate uh, Lord how we are pursuing or not pursuing your wisdom <clears throat> Lord we have no excuse Lord it is a personal choice in our lives Lord we have choices every day that we must make whether or not or to pursue your wisdom in any number of personal situations. And so we ask that you would just highlight for our hearts and minds, Lord, the importance here and the, the wonderful gift and treasure that we have in the wisdom that you've imparted to us through your word. Lord, help us to love it, to seek it, to treasure it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.